Well, we're going to go to Joel chapter 2 tonight. And the key, the key verse around which the book is built is in Joel chapter 2. And uh, so we're going to have a Bible study. But first, you know, I like to tell my wife she's got to be ready to preach, pray, or die at any moment. And uh, no, 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 I, I never said anything about a cough ever. But it, anyway, you, when you finish coughing, you stand up and pray for us, okay? Amen. We got to thank Tony in the AV room. She's the new Ray. And she and Ray were talking tonight. Uh, she was getting her tutorial and all things are well. So thank you, Tony, for being here. And thank you for helping me. <laughs> okay, let's, let's review a little bit. Now I'm going to do this by way of a pop quiz just because that's fun. And I want to, I want to, I know nobody's writing everything down, but I want to see how much you're retaining from week to week, okay? Who wants to tell me as closest thing to a date that most scholars are, are saying they believe is, is when Joel was written? Fifth century. I didn't review that with her at the house. I'm serious. She knows more about it than I do, actually. Ever feel that way, Gary? Our wives sometimes, <laughs> we can turn it over. Doreen, what, what year was it? I, I was at Buck Shootem in Port Norris. We, we, we were newlyweds, we, we were. And I woke up on, on the Sunday that was Christmas Sunday. Yeah, and I mean, I was sick. I was, you know, vomiting, et cetera, and you don't need any, any details, but I mean, it was, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't stand up in front of a church. So I called the lay leader and I said, you're going to have to fill in to me today. He said, no, I'm not. <laughs> I said, well, I can't make it. He said, well, good. Then nobody will make it. But you're not getting me up there on this, this amount of notice. And I said, well, I'm not canceling church on Christmas day. And so, uh, I don't know if I asked you or you volunteered. I think you volunteered. Oh, well, I'm glad you remember that detail for me. But anyway, I want you to say this. I want you to know this. I could ask her. That still doesn't mean she's going to say yes. You know, my bride's always been gifted with free will of her own, and she, and she uses it. And what did she do? She went and preached two services. And at the end of four years, they said that was the best service they'd <laughs> That, the best sermon they'd ever heard at the end of four years of my first parish. So, uh, so she can't only pray is what I'm trying to tell you. But I can also tell you it might be a challenge to get her to preach on that short of notice. <laughs> okay, so 5th century. That makes it, as far as the minor prophets go, pretty close to the advent of Jesus, if, if you want to say 500 years is that but it's as close to the advent of jesus uh or, or it's as close to the advent of jesus as malachi's prophecy is of jesus showing up about 500 years and uh, so when malachi says the lord whom you seek will come suddenly to the temple there there are those who are you 500 years <laughs> doesn't seem so sudden to them but He's not meeting the kind of sudden that it's going to be happening immediately, but it's going to be happening pretty unexpectedly. 
And so, fifth century. Okay. We talked about options of understanding the locusts last week in chapter one. And you know, it, 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 it went all over all kinds of locusts and everything. And what did we say about those locusts? Yes, that's, that's especially what your husband held to. There are three options. There's the literal option. There's the metaphorical option. And one of those two options are for captors. And, you know, there, there, there's a pretty wide range of biblical interpretation where the commentary is going to say that's what they believe. But there's a third, literal and do you know what we're talking about? If you're here for the first time, let me say. Here's what I'm talking about. Look at verse 4 of chapter 1. This is all by way of review. What the locust swarm has left, the great locusts have eaten. What the great locusts have eaten, have left, the young locusts have eaten. What the young locusts have left, other locusts have eaten. And every place the word locust is used there is a different Hebrew word implying that we're not all talking about the literal word locust although still the literal interpretation is is one one major possibility so we have the literal interpretation we have the figurative interpretation and if so then one of the metaphors is for their captors and who did we say the three possible captors are? Yeah. Assyria, Persia, and Babylon. At least those are in the time period of this. Uh, okay. Now, we said that Joel represents a certain type of biblical literature. What type was that? First word, post. That's right, the post-exilic literature, meaning it's the Jews trying to reestablish their culture around Jerusalem after the exile. All right. Okay. Now, if, if it's neither literal, nor is it speaking about captors, what is the third possibility of interpretation? for the book of Joel. The four types of locusts could represent what? Well, sure, that's, uh, and that's because of the word, you know, they take their freedom interpreting, right? Yes. Um, do you remember I said there's a construction, a recurring construction around a phrase in Joel? Right, the day of the Lord. And you've got four to five of those, and uh, one was more or less an introduction to it. So, yeah. What, what are you saying, G? Well, it certainly is if, if one would agree that the day of the Lord is is the central event out there of things yet to come, the fulfillment, right. Okay, so those are the three possibilities. Now let's take a look at uh, the beginning of chapter 2. And I want somebody to read verses 1 through 5 of Joel chapter 2. There's a lot of material in here tonight. So we're going to have to keep the hammer down on it. So read it out. Existed in 
made this pact and never will again in all the generations to come. It expires with value and some of them, and behind them a flame blazes. The man in front of them is like the Garden of Eden, but behind them it is like a desert wasteland. There is no escape from them. Their appearance is like that of horses, and they gallop. Yes, please. They bound him on the top of the mountain. Their sound is like the sound of chariots, like the sound of fiery flames consuming stubble, like a mighty army before you the Lord. Okay. Now I want somebody to read verses 6 through 11. You missed your calling, Vic. You should have been a preacher. You, uh, you read the scripture well. You have a good speaking voice. So there, if you ever get called as a second location, I'm ready for it. You come on down, come on down to Wilmore and we'll get you trained up. <laughs> okay. Um, so, the opening of Joel chapter 2 picks up with the day of the Lord. And it speaks. Now, what do you notice right out of the gate in, in Joel chapter 2? What observation? What's the call to? To what? Yeah, blow the trumpet of alarm. Sure. Sure, you know, you can blow the trumpet like Kenny G. Do anybody, does anybody here even know Kenny G and his trumpet playing? Okay, I say these things sometime and I thought, uh-oh, I've just, I've just sunk the whole group of them. I'd like to have Kenny G play with Synergy or our praise band, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> Life would get better. Or you could blow the trumpet. Before the Kentucky Derby, one of my wife's favorite things, being married to a Kentuckian, she thinks the Kentucky Derby is like the Super Bowl, man. She, she is after it. Um, yeah. I asked her that this last week. I said, honey, do you own a bonnet? She said, I don't think so. I said, well, how can I take you to the Kentucky Derby then? She laughed at me. Yeah. Well... So, but it's a trumpet to sound an alarm. Now, the trumpet to sound an alarm was a frequent thing if there was going to be an invasion. And so the people say, blow that alarm trumpet in Zion. For what reason? Why did they, why did Joel say to blow the alarm? For the day of the Lord's coming. Let me ask you this question. Is there going to be a trumpet sound when the day of the Lord comes about Christ's return? Listen to the, what it says. The trumpet shall sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Corruption itself is going to cease. And so we sing... Uh, we had the men sing this last summer, when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more, and the morning breaks eternal, bright and fair. That comes from what hymn? See, Joan, I, you know these answers on this. Uh, she knows her hymnology. She, 
she's, she's grow, she grew up a singer of hymnology, and I, I, do, I do love that. Right, when the roll is caught up yonder, and there's one more, what, what happens when the roll's caught up yonder? I'll be there. How many are able to give a testimony with uh, fair assurance tonight that you really believe in your heart when the roll is caught up yonder, you'll be there? Just raise your hand. That, that's wonderful that you all have that assurance. I believe that too. I don't believe I'll, I'm worthy to be there. Okay, now where did they want the trumpet to be blown? On what hill? Holy hill. You know what the word says about holiness? If you don't have it, you'll not see the Lord. It's the holy hill. These are the people that are going to see the Lord. Now, let me get, see, I think you should make a little note-taking file and put it under this category, Ron's rants. Because there are three or four hobby horse rants that I have, and the Holy Hill is one of them. <laughs> because the business that we think that we love Christ just so he saves my hide from a fiery furnace, that's not what salvation is all about. That's a part of what it's about. He does save us from the punishment of sin. But he saves us to transform him so that we shall be like him. And I've just said that quietest I've ever said it in 43 years. It only gets, you, you say, I thought you said it pretty forcefully. Well, that was the least forcefully I've said it in 43 years. We shall be like him. Listen to when John interprets that day. Beloved, now we are the children of God. King James says, sons of God. Doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, what? We shall be like him. And to be like him, you're holy. You're holy. Christ not only saves us from the penalty of sin. He offers us the power to do battle against sin so that Romans chapter 8 is fulfilled through our lives. We put to death through the power of the Spirit the deeds of the flesh. That's a great topic. Now listen, if you're hearing about that, and your response in your heart is, I don't know a lot about that, I want you to take time to make an appointment and come see me. Because this subject is far, far too important for us not to have had a very robust conversation around it, okay? You'll make my day if you, if you schedule an appointment and say, Ron, I want to talk to you about uh, Christ's power to make us holy. It was spoken of in John chapter 1. As many as received him, to them gave he power to become the children of God. And the power to become children of God is the power to be holy. The reason why I say that is we won't finish the end of chapter 2 without you recognizing that you've suddenly wound up in the second chapter of Acts where, you, where the disciples received power from on high beautiful thing now why do you suppose it says let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming what what is uh, what makes a human being tremble at the day of the Lord fear okay what kind of fear I mean what are the kind of things that you think you would fear on the day of the Lord or that a human could fear on the day of the Lord Okay, we fear, I, can't, I guess you could say we fear our own inferiority uh, on the issue. Yes, Sandy, what were you saying? You're, you're afraid to hear the words of judgment come 
Depart, depart from me, I never knew you. How about that one? Depart from me, I never knew you. Woo. Man, that would give you a nightmare, wouldn't it? But why shouldn't you fear that? Because there remains a rest for the people of God. Yeah. You have the privilege as the people of God to have assurance. Romans 8, 16. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Bears witness with it. John Wesley used to love to talk to his parishioners about the witness of the Spirit. The witness of the Spirit. Okay, some of the other things that uh, you notice about what we've read to date here tonight on chapter 2. What's the day of the Lord like? Let me ask you that one more interpretive question. It's a day of darkness and gloom. All right. It's great and it's dreadful at the same time. Why not? If it's the great day of separation where the sheep and the goats are headed in opposite directions. It's, it's final, isn't it? The thing that amazes me about the day of the Lord is its finality. When it happens, it's not going to happen again. You can bring it up multiple times in Scripture, but when it happens, it's not happening again. It's it's final. What scares you about hearing those words that it's final? What's that? Yeah, it's the end. Anybody here ever used to, anybody here ever, I don't know if you ever lived, listened to country music, when you've, uh, when you've lived in Kentucky and Mississippi, You've narrowed your choices down sometimes on what's playing over the airwaves. Plus, I just, I just love hearing it, you know. My girlfriend dropped me like a, all I have left is my dog, and one of us is getting run over by a train for sure, you know, something like that. So I kind of like the, the recurring themes in country music. But uh, there was a country music group called the Oak Ridge Boys. Anybody here ever hear the Oak Ridge Boys? Several members of the Oak Ridge Boys used to be in a gospel band that played in South Jersey. Anybody remember what that gospel band was called? You remember, Gary? The Keystones. Anybody ever hear of the Keystones? And their piano player was named Garland Kraft. Garland Kraft later got so so in trouble with opioids long before that was an epidemic that he was really fighting for his life. But when he just joined the Oak Ridge Boys and he, he was finishing up his tour with the, with the gospel music crew, he wrote a song called One More Day. One More Day before the day of the Lord. Listen to what he said in that song. If my time on earth is long and I am young and I see God's people dying, I want to help them. For if Jesus comes tomorrow, I'd have just one more day. One more day could separate the worlds. One more day and time will be no longer. For when he comes, he'll give no warning. And when it all begins to happen, when he's gone, ascended into heaven, we would not know that we had one more day. Profound, isn't it? There is a time towards which we're moving according to prophecy where we could have one more day. But when the day of the Lord comes, we won't have one other day. The day of the Lord will redefine everything to eternal rest or eternal separation. 
So look at what he's saying in verse 3. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Behind them, a desert waste. Nothing escapes them. Now, I want to read to you the kind of before them passage that he's talking about. Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed from her, for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. That's a pretty beautiful tomorrow, isn't it? We read that a lot at funerals of what life is like when the tabernacle of God is again among his, his people. And so Joel is saying, that's the future for the people who are on the right side of the day of the Lord. But for those who are facing him, not like a Lord, but as judge, it's dreadful. The Bible says if you face that day and you're not prepared for the day of the Lord, there will be bitter weeping and gnashing of teeth. And people will actually cry for the mountains to fall on them. Oh, you know, I'm going to tell you a material weakness in my life. If I ever have a dream, I, I, I wake up in cold sweats, as they say. I, I, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely claustrophobic. I'll just tell you a good way to get rid of me early. Just put me in a straitjacket. I'll be insane within the next 15 minutes. You know, I, I can't even think the thought. I'll have those dreams after I'd seen it on a nude cat, not a nude cast. I'm, I'm rebuking Satan for that one, you know. The newscast, and the newscast is about, you know, like a building collapsing on someone and they're waiting to get dug out. Oh, my. That, that one does it for me. I mean, that's the most horrific thing for me that, that there is. And, and quite a while ago, I mean years and years ago, when they showed that, that uh, bridge of the earthquake collapsing in California and there were, there were people on it and the bridge fell down, and whew, man, I can't even now talk about it. It, it, I, it does things to me, you know. You got to be pretty desperate to cry out for the mountain to fall on you. That must be an awful day. When in your worst of days did you ever hope that the mountain would fall on you? Avalanche? But that's what's going to happen, the Bible says, when you're in the bad category instead of the right category. Now, now, in case that puts a, a fear in you, and I don't, uh, we, we're, not, we're no longer a child of fear, the Word of God says, listen to the great comforting words, okay? The great comforting words is, whosoever will may come, and the one that comes to me, I'll never turn away. So you don't have to fear this, but it's talking about a culture that won't come to Christ, that hardens their hearts. Now, there's an issue with hardening your hearts because Israel while starting out with God, hardened their hearts against God. 
And Joel is saying, if you do that, you'll never recover from it. You've got to seek the Lord. And that's what's all set up. Now, there's, there are horses that are brought into this day of the Lord. And many scholars feel like this is a direct reference to when the horses are let loose in Revelation leading up to that, that final trumpet, you know. And there are four of them, aren't there, in, in Revelation. And, and that these horses, you know, you know the end is near when you see the four horses from Revelation. Now, you're not going to see those literally, I don't guess. I don't know whether you will or not, literally. I don't, I don't know. Whether, <laughs> I mean, God's going to do it the way he wants to do it, and I'm not sure I can tell you which of the things he's going to choose. But whatever he chooses, we have one we have one option that is the, the redemptive option, and that is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not under your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge Him. And He what? He will direct your paths. Wow, how good is that one? So, so if I did cause any fear by my language, when I say to you, this verse is for you tonight so that you can get over any fear, of that in your language and that is Jesus says the one that comes to me I will never turn away that verse is for you tonight Ron's not talking to you about judgment because I think uh, anybody ought to go there I talk to you about the judgment that Joel is using to speak about and I want you to know the promises are there for you in other words there's uh, there's no excuse for us not casting ourselves upon a God who cares for us, right? That's our privilege. Aren't you glad when you read about the day of the Lord and the wrong side of things? That's a privilege, huh? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. And so, grandmom, grandpop, you make sure you teach your children that the Lord said, anybody who comes to me, he'll never turn away. You know what I was thinking today? was about the fourth stanza, the closing stanza of that hymn. Usually they put four in. There, there probably were a lot more than that. But the final stanza to the hymn, How Firm a Foundation. Anybody remember the very last stanza by memory to How Firm a Foundation? Raise your hand if you remember. You remember it, Linda? The last stanza? You were nodding. That's why I called you out. The soul that on Jesus hath leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to its foes. That soul, though all hell should endeavor to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Isn't that glorious? By the way, just another little piece of trivia. That song was the, was the anthem of the Confederacy during the great times of revival in the Civil War. That was the anthem for the Confederacy. Yeah. I think it'd be important to know if you're losing a war that you're not forsaken by the God that you love. Wouldn't you? Especially as it turns out to be one of the two bloodiest wars in American history. God's not going to forsake you. There was a great turning to God during the time of the Civil War. Okay, now here we go. Somebody read verses 12 through 17.
Okay, notice there's a second trumpet. The first trumpet sounds and there's judgment. And there are those who are not going to escape the finality of the day of the Lord, the Oak Ridge Boys piano player. One more day. The second trumpet is a call to action for those who believe the Lord. Prayer and fasting. And back in this time, whenever there was a national time of prayer and fasting, they would often sit in sackcloth and ashes. So that like we had our Ash Wednesday service to determine 40 days of consecration to the Lord in deeper ways in the Lenten period, they would use their sackcloth and ashes to say that in a time of great turning, when decisions are being made, let the people know that our decision is to follow the Lord. So blow that trumpet. So there's a contrast. Say, listen now, the trumpet will sound. When the trumpet sounds, on which side of eternity will you be on? The side that is an enemy of God or the side that is a friend of God? That's what Joel is saying. You have a choice. And when you give yourself to God, he's slow to anger. He abounds in compassion. And maybe as soon as you pray, God will relent. And instead of there being judgment, there will be blessing. Let me ask you just, I'm, I'm just trying for discussion. When we see national calamities, does anybody in America, I'm asking in America anymore, does anybody feel like sometimes in the midst of national calamities that the Lord's hand could be in those calamities and the hand is a, a hand of judgment? Here's what I'm going to tell you. If you do see it that way, you're going to be the first one called out in Christianity today as being a, a right-wing fundamentalist that... Uh, doesn't say things correctly but let me tell you how important is it i'd rather be on the right side being called a right wing fundamentalist in this passage than than dare be on the left side can god allow things in his permissive will believing that something good could come out of it okay if you're saying sure does anybody want to take a risk on what kind of thing can anybody interpret anything in history where you might believe and if that's too vulnerable for you i understand you don't have to you don't have to do it unless you feel like you don't mind doing it weather, weather? so in other words since the book of matthew says that we're to be reminded of the day of the lord when we see earthquakes and pestilences and things like that happening it ought to remind us that's by the way that's a really really good answer because that's exactly the kind of thing I'm looking for. Aren't there signs of the times? Immorality. Yeah, growing immorality. Don't you wonder, One C.S. Lewis said that it grieves Christ that the world is growing so old. And by old it means, you know, tired of the teachings on the Lord, throwing over those kinds of things. Do you think by reading our newspapers, or maybe we read the internet now more than we read the newspapers, or listening to our news, do you think after you've heard it, you get a belly full and say, we got a tired world. Our world saddens us. How many remember the name Paul Harvey? Raise your hand. And what, what, famous, uh, what famous gig was Paul Harvey famous for what what about 1965 if I were the devil. yeah if i were the devil and he had a program called what the rest of the story and he always the rest of the story was always good it was never bad news paul harvey invested a lot of money in the grit newspaper anybody here ever read one of the grit newspaper did you gary You and me too, brother. I was a grit newspaper boy. See, that's the difference between Darina and me. 
You know, a grit is something Dorena eats. It's something I read. <laughs> That's the difference between a southerner and a northeasterner right there. Up here we read them, down there they eat them. Right? Man, when I went to Asbury and first tasted grits in the cafeteria, I was, I, I was mad. I thought somebody served me recycled wallpaper paste. It was the most awful thing ever. But now, I not only like them, I love them. But I tell you this, my wife, that's, you're talking the truth. And know what? I got a Southern girl that taught me how to eat them. I've got them in my pantry right now. But for Darina, a really good restaurant is a restaurant where she can look on the menu and see shrimp and grits. She loves that, okay? But when Paul Harvey invested heavily, millions in the grit, and you remember where it was published? <coughs> Williamsport, where, where, the, where the World Series, Little League World Series is. Pencil, Williamsport, Pennsylvania. What's that? Yeah, yeah, it was a newspaper. No, not just regular. It, it, it was a newspaper that only would print good news. They weren't, they weren't going to print anything bad news. It was almost like... Uh, Oh, what's that magazine that has a real uh, guideposts? Yeah, its purpose was like guideposts, to tell the rest of the story and good news and things like that. And uh, Gary and I both, I, I, I don't know if you were a little ahead of me, but when, by the time I was selling them, it was 15 cents a copy. I got to keep a nickel and I sent 10 cents, the other 10 cents into Williamsport. Yep, so if I sold 100, you know, I made five bucks. Whew. That's why I'm rich today. That's honestly, that's why, that's why Darina has such a strong retirement, man. I, I banked that, I banked that five bucks a week from the newspaper. <laughs> okay. Now, all of that to say the right side and the wrong side, and now they're they're declaring that they want the trumpet to sound to call people to prayer. And we have read in this last passage that you read the key verse of the book of Joel. Does anyone take a guess at what it is? Yes. Wow. That's good. I knew you were good, but you were that good. You just got the A in the... She said, rend your heart and not your garments. That is the key verse in the book of Joel. Because it's possible to have a ceremonial religion, right? Let's plug it into our day. Possible? Do you think it's possible that out of religious ceremony, people come and take the sacrament of the Lord, but they're really not in tune enough with the Lord to say, Lord Jesus, I'm, I'm receiving you into my heart right this minute. You think that's possible? You think it's possible to present babies for baptism and say you profess your faith in, in Jesus Christ but not really live that out? Not only is it possible today, back in John Chrysostom's day, it was possible to be an adult and say you wanted to profess faith in Jesus and be baptized, but if in your heart you weren't truly putting your trust and faith in God, John Chrysostom said you're just getting all wet. He, he, he didn't make his parishioners happy when he preached that sermon. Point taken, it's possible to coming to church. One of the Smithisms, I don't think it's original to me, I just say it every so often, that you ought to get is, you coming to church isn't going to make you a Christian any more than and going to Dunkin' is going to make you a donut. You don't, the way you become isn't by attending, that helps. But the way you become is by grace through faith. Put your trust in God. And so, so Joel is trying to say, here is what you need to do. Get beyond religious ceremony and into that general, that genuine, authentic relationship with Christ. How urgent is it? Let the bride leave her honeymoon chamber. 
Let the groom leave the honeymoon chamber. Come to the Lord while you can, because it can't wait one more day, because what if there is only one more day? All right, I'm going to stop right there. You've, you've, you've been hit with the old fire hose so far coming tonight. What are the things that strike you about the discussion? Or what questions do you have? Or maybe something I've said, you say, mm, I don't know. I need to hear Ron's follow-up idea. And first, I, I want to tell you, I don't profess in any way, shape, or form to understand any more about this book than you would. You have the power of the Holy Spirit, and it's His Word, so there might be many here that have a deeper understanding than what I have. So I just pause to hear any questions or commentary or, that you would like to give. What strikes you? So we live every moment as if it's uh, our moment unto the Lord, right? I mean, the, the New Testament makes it this practical. So whether we eat or drink, you know, we do all to the glory of God. That's pretty good coming from a fellowship dinner because you just practiced that. You ate to the glory of God in fellowship of the Lord. Okay, what else? Any other commentary? I'd give, you, I'd give you my own phrase title on this right now that expresses just what you said. Not religious ceremony, but heartfelt sanctimony. A heart that's sanctified between you and your Lord. Not religious ceremony, but heartfelt sanctimony. And it's covered in this verse. When your heart not your garment. Boy, I'd just like to walk around repeating that one. Rend your heart and not your garment. Rend your heart and not your garment. Fantastic theology. You ever heard this phrase? Oh, it was heart-rending. It comes from the book of Joel. That's where the adage was taken from. Heart-rending. Don't you think it would please God tonight? If all of us left the sanctuary with heart-rending religion, rend your heart. In this instance, what is the definition of rend? Rend your heart. What's the definition for that? What's it mean to rend your heart? Yeah, give it. Give your heart to God. Completely. Yeah. I mean, heart-rending is the passionate thing. If I... If I were to tell somebody on the way out the door about some situation of somebody in the church, I said, oh, that's heart-rending, isn't it? I mean, that means it's passionately, it's passionately something that just uh, creates a, a sorrow in us as we're entering into the sufferings of another. Well, heart-rending religion for Joel is that. With all of your passion, give your heart to the God who wants to put you on the right side. Of the day of the Lord. I, uh, I had a fellow in my church. Oh man, you would have loved meeting him. First of all, you wouldn't have all only loved meeting him. He, he, whew, you'd have shaken your head because he was an old fashioned shouting at the top of his voice, Tennessee Hills holiness man. And if I preached a sermon, this was an unusual day for him. He'd get out his hanky, he'd start stomping around the sanctuary. Now, I want you to know this. I was in a church just outside of Smithville. United Methodists just outside of Smithville are not particularly known for taking out their hanky and start marching around the sanctuary during the sermon. But that's what he'd do. One time I was preached on knowing him. 
in the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection. Man, he was waving that hanky and he's yelling at the top of his lung, it works, it works. Thank God Almighty, it still works. That, that, that was Brother Richards. Man, he was a shout. Now, I prayed with him at 5.30 every Thursday morning. We had prayer time. Whew, I wish you could hear Brother Richards pray. Oh, my goodness. He's in heaven now. But one time I decided I was going to take Cliff Richards to hear Dr. Kinlaw speak at Delanco Camp. Now, now sitting right next to me was a former Roman Catholic priest that got converted, Skip Morsos. You remember Skip? He was sitting right next to me. No, no, he was sitting right next to Cliff Richards. Cliff Richards was sitting next to me. And then, now, now he was the kind of Pentecostal that had certain signs where you could say, okay, it's T minus 10 seconds till blast off. Because here are the things he'd always begin to do when he started to get blessed. He'd start rocking back and forth in this pew. And then I'm thought, oh, I see the motion. Cliff's, uh, Cliff's going to let her fly any minute here. And then he would start to do something else that would tune it up even, to, even quicker. He'd start groaning. He'd go, oh, oh. People didn't know what's going on. I mean, they were wondering if he's having a heart attack or whatever. And then he'd go, just, just like a wind blowing. And then the final thing he'd do, this was his fourth and final sign. If he leaned forward and started pounding the pew, I'm telling you, it was three seconds till blast off. Well, this fine pastor that was a former Roman Catholic priest, He's sitting next to him, and Cliff starts with all four signs. And I'm, and I'm just shocked. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness, Dr. Kinlaw doesn't know him. I, I, I don't know what I can do. But the very minute I started thinking the thought was too late, Cliff got up. He took one jump over, over that Roman Catholic priest, and he started down the aisle. And he's in the back where Scott Rambo is, and he's going, oh, Dr. Kinlaw. That's the kind of preaching that affects me. And he'd make these groans, and I'm thinking, here we go. And he walks up, and Dennis Kinlaw, just uh, knowing the holiness tradition, and not only that, recognizing that Cliff uh, wanted to share, he gave up the pulpit. Now, I want to tell you, that's like about asking Billy Graham to give up the pulpit, you know, in my, my opinion, but they gladly did it. And Cliff Richards, I'll never forget what he said to the people at Delanco Camp. He's pounding, he's going, oh, 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 bless his holy name forever. Then he said this. He said in 1954, because Dennis Kinlaw was preaching about the reality that it's possible for Christians to be devoted enough in their heart where they honestly can testify that their heart wholly belongs to God and that holiness is the, the testimony of a heart that wholly belongs to God. W-H-O-L-L-Y translates to H-O-L-Y. And Dennis Kinlaw said the reason why few Americans get into that deep experience of entire sanctification is we're not willing to die to self. So Kinlaw was speaking about dying to self. So here's Richards. Oh! In 1954 I attended a funeral. It was mine! Praise God! And he said, and so far as I can tell, I've been dead ever since. And he was right adjacent to the door. He walked out the door, and he started doing a whole lap around that tabernacle, shouting at the top of his lungs, glory to God, hallelujah. I mean, he's doing a lap around that tabernacle. And so that former Roman Catholic priest said, you know him? I said, yeah, I brought him. <laughs> he said, is he always like that? I said, He's always like that. And he goes, that dude is heavy. 
I guess that is pretty heavy. It's pretty heavy when a person can love God with such a sincerity of heart at God's invitation that we have the assurance that God is never going to deny our heart-rending experience. If you want to give Him your heart so that your heart is wholly His, you have every confidence in the world in Holy Scripture that He can make out of you no matter how humble the origins, no matter how deep the sin, God can make out of you a holy woman, a holy man. And you can testify along with Brother Richards and the Apostle Paul that you attended a funeral service and it was yours. And you died to self so that along with the Apostle you can close with this thought. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet it's not I who lives in me. It's the Son of God who loved me, who gave himself for me. I attended a funeral, it was mine. And it was the day I rendered my heart to God instead of just participating in a religious ceremony. Wow. And I want to say tonight, with all of the confidence from Genesis through Revelation, that's your privilege in Christ Jesus. No matter how much the gnawing locust is eaten out of your life, no matter how long you've lived in captivity, no matter how difficult your experiences are, there's one thing that remains for the people of God to align themselves on the right side of the day of the Lord and say, I don't know what I even think of my heart, but here's what I promise. It's all yours, Lord. Will you take it? So Charles Wesley, and we might even sing it Sunday. Scott told me on one of the Sundays I wasn't here that he had it in the order of worship. Charles Wesley's hymn, Oh, for a heart to praise my God. A heart from sin set free. A heart that always feels your blood so freely shed for me. Here's the word of peace and benediction tonight. Rend your heart, not your garments. And walk out tonight of the sanctuary, knowing because you've given your whole heart to God, you're leaving then with a holy heart to God. And the blessing of the Father, and then the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, be with you all. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you.